I was walking through the gates of the Green Mount Cemetery, and this monument, more like a sculpture, really stood out to me in this more historic old cemetery. As I walked up, it had three granite steps as I got closer to it, inviting you to get near it. It was a bronze statue about five feet high of a man sitting down, his head tossed back, his eyes closed, his lips parted, and he was wearing this like shroud over his head that just flowed all the way down his body and pooled around his feet. There was a little bit of his the shroud that wasn't covering his shoulder, and you could tell that this was a young man. And on either side were these curved granite walls where there were wreaths carved into them, and in between, an inscription. This is a picture of what I saw. Has anyone seen this at the Green Mount Cemetery? And on the right side, it says, Thou shall not go like a quarry slave at night, scourged to the dungeon, but rather soothed and sustained with unfaltering trust. And on the right side, it says, Approach thy grave like one who wraps the drapery of their couch about him as if to lie down for pleasant dream. I don't know about you, but this did leave an indelible mark to me. And not only that, I had to explore it and find out more about this monument and who was John E. Hubbard. The story began in 1890. John Hubbard's aunt, Frances Kellogg, passed away, and her husband predeceased her. They had no children, and John thought he would be the benefactor of his aunt Franny's estate. But John had a little bit of surprise coming because he wasn't even named in the will. I'm sure John was very disappointed and what happened from there split the community because John did the unthinkable. He contested Aunt Franny's will. And for a number of years, there was this fight about the will and the judge finally determined that the will was invalid. So John got all Aunt Franny's money. She had $300,000, which was earmarked, to build the, the gates to the Greenmount Cemetery, to build the chapel, and to build the library. And this set a course. And two things happened where the town officials sued John because they wanted that money for the projects that Aunt Franny asked and put in her will. But they were able to settle that out of court because John did agree to go ahead and have the library built. He gave $30,000 for that library to be built. But the second thing that happened is Professor Burgess. Now here's a historian. He taught at Columbia University and he was livid. He was a friend of the Kellogg's. He summered in Montpelier and he did not want to see John get that money. He made it his mission for the rest of his life to tarnish John's, uh, to tarnish John's memory in everyone in town or forever in history. He was so obsessed about it that he even wrote it in his memoirs, a whole chapter just dedicated to John. Well, 
what Professor Burgess did to get back at John is he built another library, a rival library. Not only that, but he was friends with Thomas Waterman Wood, Thomas Waterman Wood, who was a very famous painter in that area. He deeded 42 of his paintings for that library, the li rival library. So now it's more of an upscale gallery library. Well, about a year later, the Hubbard Kellogg Library opened up. And that library opened up with 6,000 books in it. The rival library had thousands more. You see, John agreed to build a library, not to furnish it with books. Now, this dueling of these libraries went on for a number of years until John's death when he was 50, 51 years old. The townspeople were quite curious to find out what was in John's will. And they were surprised to learn that John left a lot of money for the public projects that Aunt Franny originally wanted. But he did more than just that. He left, three, he had an estate of $300,000. He had left that money for the gates to be built at the Greenmount Chapel, uh, in the, and the chapel at the Greenmount Cemetery. So he did those two things. He also left money for the sculpture that I ended up seeing in that monument. He left over 140 acres of land to develop a public park. Not only that, he left money enough to do the caretaking of each of these properties for many years. And in addition to that, he left the rest of his money to some surviving relatives. The question is, did John have remorse for not originally seeing his aunt's will carried out? Or was he severely misjudged? Sometimes we look at the actions of people and come to our own conclusions and opinions about them because we don't understand the rest of the situation. That might have happened. Now, there was nothing that said that John spoke any ill will of anyone or that he tried to take any revenge like others had done to him. And in the end, I don't think he was scourged to the dungeon, but he was able to lie in peace in virtue. But I would say, no matter what side you're on, that John really had the last word, and still does today, because the residents of Montpelier and the visitors that go enjoy all of these public places that are still available for us to enjoy today.